recording. Mm-hmm. All right, so put this one here. So you get that bit together. All right, so it's me. So you have these things. So we can get started. And thank you everyone that registered and that is on live, that watched the podcast, learning about oh, the legal side of running your business. We have two presentations for you today. I call it the good side of law and the bad side of law. What to do to protect yourself from with contracts, NDAs, and registering your business properly. And if things do go sideways, what happens if you either need to sue somebody or if you are being sued? So our first presenter is Andrea Henry from Andrew. Is it Henry Law? Henry it's Business Henry Law. Business Henry, Law. Business Law. Yeah. Henry Business Law. So we are in your hands. I will mute myself and can take it away. Thank you so much. All right. So I'm going to do a whistle stop to, through the main things that you need to know as an entrepreneur. I'm going to start off with this disclaimer because I'm a lawyer and I can't help it. So you understand that this is just for educational purposes. You haven't hired me and you know that because nobody has passed hands yet, right? So um, a little bit about me. I'm a mom of three. Um, so the quarantine has been particularly interesting for me. I've been a business and tax lawyer for 13 years now. Um, I have a master's from Cambridge University in the UK and a master's in business and tax law from Osgood in Toronto. And I am an entrepreneur myself. My father and I have a line of um, Caribbean SERPs. Okay, so what we're we going to cover today, your startup, so business structures, how are you going to own your business when you start? As you start to grow, what are the contracts that you need? As you build your team, what do you need to know? And as you build your brand, what are some of the intellectual property considerations? And then quite often when we start, we're not thinking about the end, but it's really important that we think from the beginning about how it is that we want to exit our businesses and how are we going to leave a legacy for the next generation, which is particularly important in our community. So first up, how do you own your business? Tanya talked a little bit about it over on the, um, on the show, but in Canada, there are three main ways in which you can own a business. You can have a sole proprietorship, which is essentially you've just decided that you run a business. There's no legal separation between the business and you. You can have a partnership, which is essentially a sole proprietorship with more than one person, or you can have a corporation. And a corporation is a separate legal entity. It's considered by law to be a legal person with the same powers and the same rights and everything else as a flesh and blood person. So if you think of it, those who, of you who have children, you know, when the mom is pregnant, that's kind of like a sole proprietorship. The business, the, the, the mom and the baby don't have any legal separation. When that child is born and grows up and becomes 19 and goes off to college and signs a lease, he can sign a lease on his own, right? It's a separate legal entity. And because of that status as a separate legal entity, a corporation can allow you some flexibility in your business that you might not necessarily have um, if you're running it as a sole proprietorship or a partnership. Before we go any further, I'm going to do a crash course on some of the terms that I'm going to use. So a share in a corporation is literally that. It's a piece of the pie. Now, you can have all kinds of different shares. You can have shares that entitle you to the underlying assets. You can have shares that entitle you to vote. You can have shares that give you a guaranteed dividend, shares that are paid out in preference to other shares. But essentially, it's having a piece of the pie. It's, it's, it's having a stake in the corporation. A dividend is if at the end of the year or at the end of the quarter, you've made a profit, you can say, I'm going to share some or all of this profit with all of the shareholders or some of the shareholders of the corporation. And capital gains, anyone in, in real estate will know this is essentially the difference between what you bought something for and what you sell it for. And it's not just in real estate, it applies to businesses as well. And we'll get to that when we talk about how you exit your business. So 
advantages and disadvantages of incorporation. It's the question that I get asked the most frequently. Should I incorporate? When should I incorporate? Is there a certain um, revenue level at which I should incorporate? And the answer is really, it depends, right? So one of the key advantages is limited liability. Because your corporation is a separate legal entity and you run your business through this separate legal entity, any liabilities, any claims, any debts that come up in that corporation, they don't, leak, sorry, they don't leak into your personal assets. So if you're a sole proprietor and you're running the business and someone sues you, they are suing you, which means your house, your car, the money in the bank, all of that is available to satisfy a claim. If someone sues your corporation, they are suing a separate legal person and only the assets of the corporation are available. Now there's some exceptions and Tanya may talk about it later. If you're not running your corporation properly, if you're mixing personal and business expenses, or if you've signed as a personal guarantor of the debts of your corporation, or if you haven't completed all the formalities, so issuing shares and passing resolutions, if you don't have any of that, then the law will say you're not treating it as a separate legal entity, so neither will we, right? That's what the courts will say. But if you follow all of the guidelines and you treat your corporation as a separate legal entity, you benefit from that limited liability. It's got perpetual existence, right? At some point we will die. A corporation can live on forever. That's so important when we're trying to build businesses that we can pass on through the generations. Income flexibility. So if you are running your business as a sole proprietorship, money comes in as revenue, you pay all your business expenses, what's left over at the end of the year is your profit. And CRA does not care whether you spend that money this year. They don't care whether you plan to reinvest it into the business next year. They're not interested in any of that. You're going to pay tax on all of the profit. If you are running your business as a corporation, you can decide how much to take out for yourself if there's profit left over at the end of the year and how much to leave in the business. And the money that you leave in the corporation is going to be taxed at a lower rate. If it's, and if you're making under 500,000 in Ontario, it's 12.2%, which is much lower than, than most personal tax rates. And so you can leave that money in the corporation and you can leave it for a rainy day. You can leave it to reinvest in the next year. Um, you can buy insurance, you can do all kinds of things. And now you have more money to do it with because you've paid a lot less in tax. Ease of financing. So one, banks will much prefer for you to be a corporation, but also suppose you don't want to take on debt. Maybe you want to have investors instead. If you're a sole proprietor, the only way you can take on additional money that you haven't you know, sold your product or service for is for someone to lend you money because you can't sell you, right? You can't sell, or hopefully you won't sell a kidney or, or a right arm. The only way is to take on debt. But if you own a corporation, you can sell shares. You can say, I think this is going to blow up. Come and buy 10% of my company for X amount. And you can use that money to fund the growth of the business in a way that doesn't require you personally to have to pay it back. And then transferability of ownership is just easier to sell a corporation. So one, being incorporated is going to make your business more attractive. So say you're in a service business and for services, the big thing is the contracts that you have, right? It's the relationships that you have with your clients. If you're a sole proprietor and I, I have a contract with you and you sell your business to someone else, I have no obligation to do business with that person. And they know that when they're buying the business from you. Whereas if I have a contract with your corporation and now you've sold the shares of that corporation, I still am bound by the contract. The corporation hasn't gone anywhere. It's just owned by someone else. So it makes your business a lot more attractive. So I've talked about all the wonderful things of incorporation. You can tell I'm a big fan of corporations, but there's always a catch. So essentially they're more expensive to, they're more expensive to maintain. You have to pay for the initial cost. You also have increased accounting on a yearly basis because now you're paying for two tax returns instead of one. And you have to, Every time you make a big decision, you have to include it in your minute book. You have to pass a resolution. And so it is more difficult and a little bit more expensive to maintain. And also if you are in, in still employed, so say this is a side hustle and you're still an employee, 
One of the disadvantages of incorporating is if you are making losses in your business, you can't then use those losses to reduce your personal income. So if you're a sole proprietor, expenses get taken away from taxable income. What's left is what you get taxed at. If you have a lot of losses in your business, it's going to reduce the amount of money you have to pay in tax. If you run a corporation and their losses, those losses are frozen in the corporation. Okay. So when you're making a determination as to whether you should incorporate or not, you need to look at the, the totality. What is it that you're planning to do with your business? Are you going to have more than one person in your business? Do you want to sell this at some point? Um, all of those things will factor in and not just, you know, if you hit a particular figure. All right. One of my other favorite things to talk about is contracts. So I talked a little bit during the podcast and my view is a contract is a story of a relationship. And if you view it, like when we watch a movie or we um, read a novel, it's the same elements. So the parties are the characters. The plot is what you expect to happen. And the only difference really is that contracts have kind of an alternative ending, right? So what if all of these things that we don't really want to happen, but what if they do happen? And what are the consequences to that? The key things um, that you need to have in a contract to make sure that you are going to, one, get paid and um, that you're going to be able to exit it if necessary, you need to have a really clear scope of work clause. You need to be as detailed as possible in terms of what it is that you need to provide or what it is the person that you're contracting with needs to provide. A lot of the disputes happen there because people had misunderstandings as to what was expected. You also need a really clear fees and payment clause. Do you provide refunds? If not, put that in the contract. Do you, are you scared that people are going to do chargebacks after they've given you their credit card? Put that in the contract. You want to be really clear about how people can pay you um, and when you're not in the position to give money back. And then kind of an exit clause, a cancellation or termination clause. What are the circumstances under which you can terminate the contract? So say, for example, we've been having a lot of, it's been eye-opening, some of the people who we thought perhaps were done with the community and have not been. Um, and so say you had sponsorship arrangements with people who've shown themselves to really not be done with the community. If you had a termination clause that allowed you to terminate the contract, if someone's behavior you know, was harmful to your brand, you would be able to get out of that without any further liability. As you grow, you're gonna to wanna to build your team. One of the key things that you need to make a determination of is, is your team member an employee or an independent contractor? And there's unfortunately no bright line. There's no, if this person does this and they're absolutely an employee and if they do that, they're absolutely independent contractor. Um, the courts and CRA will, will tend to look at, does it fall more into column A or more into column B? But generally speaking, the more control you have over someone, the more likely they're going to be an employee. So if you can tell them when to be at work and how to accomplish their work and they get the same amount kind of, you know, regardless of what they do, then that person is likely to be an employee. An independent contractor has a lot more flexibility in when they work, how they produce the end product. They quite often will work for other people. That's more likely to be an independent contractor. The key thing to bear in mind is, even if you call someone an independent contractor, if they actually are an employee, the labor board and CRA don't care what your contract says. It's what really is the case. And what sometimes happens is that you will have team members who want to be independent contractors because then you don't have to take any deductions from their pay. But when that team member becomes ill or disabled or goes on maternity leave, then they want to be an employee because they want EI. And then all of a sudden you now have to pay all the penalties and, and back deductions and interest because that person actually was an employee. The other thing I want to touch on briefly is in your contracts with employees and, and independent contractors, quite often these people are getting, like you're opening the kimono to your business, right? You're sharing the secret sauce and you have to, in a sense, like if these people are going to help you grow your business so that you can go work um, and you're genius, you have to share some information with them. But that can be scary because what if they take that information and use it to compete against you? You can cover that in a contract. 
you can have non-disclosure, non-competition, non-solicitation clauses, which say, listen, I'm sharing this information with you, but you can't use it to try to solicit and bring, you know, entice away my clients or my customers. You can't use it to go do something that's similar to mine and compete with me, right? And those are key parts of any contract with a team member. As you build your brand, as you become more visible and you have a great logo or a really creative name or a tagline, you wanna make sure that you're protecting that. So trademarks are anything that's associated with your business, anything that distinguishes your business in the marketplace. It could be a logo, a name, it could be packaging if you package in a particular way. So if you have a salon that has a particular fragrance, it could be the fragrance, but it has to be related to business. And there's a cautionary story with um, Black Girls, the Black Life, sorry, Black, Black Girl Magic hashtag, where the person who had originated it never made any money from it, never did any merchandise. And then Essence Magazine um, filed a trademark application for Black Girls Magic for a magazine. And the originator of the phrase was like, everyone knows I created it. The court didn't care. And the same thing would happen in Canada because we have similar rules in that regard because it was never a business activity, she couldn't actually prevent them from being able to get trademark protection. So if your brand is a really important part of your business, it's worthwhile to look into protecting it. And even if you're not at the point where you want to register trademark, do a Google um, alert, make sure that no one else is using it. Do a periodic sweep of social media to make sure that no one else is um, using your name or your logo because you don't want people to think that they're doing business with, with you when they're really doing business with someone else. And then my favorite part. So my goal in life, I'm, my parents and I are originally from Barbados and I am happiest when I'm on the beach with something fruity and alcoholic. And at some point, we have to exit our business, right? At some point you will, you will hopefully, <laughs> at some point you will start working. It makes sense thinking about it from now. Do you wanna pass this on to the next generation? Are you building your business up to sell? Are you essentially going to, to fund your own retirement and just retire from the business and the business will end? The reason why that's important is because it determines or it helps um, you decide what structures you're going to put in place. So did you know that if you sell the shares of a Canadian controlled private corporation, and there's capital gains because the business has increased in value, you will get a capital gains exemption of 864,000, it goes up each year per shareholder. You don't get that exemption if you're a sole proprietor or a partnership. So you want to think about what it is that you want to do at the end, because that's going to make a difference as to what you do now. I have a, a free resource. If you go to Henry Business Law backslash um, secure checklist, which is really a checklist of all the legal things that you need to, to deal with as a startup. It goes into greater detail than I could today. Please go check that out. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Hi. All right. Are you able to hear me, Andrea? Yeah, I can hear okay. you, Tanya. Okay, I, I'll start up. Ryan, did you want to say something I'll, as I turned the... So yeah, far. just quick check in if anybody did have, should we take questions now or? Yeah, go ahead. Want, yeah, if there's any questions for what Andrea went through, I was just going to put that link. Or Andrea, if you could put the link to your website. Sure. The secure checklist in the chat. Okay, I'll put it in the chat. And I did have a quick question. So mm -hmm. when you are putting together your registration, do you find progressively you kind of start a sole proprietor or maybe a partnership, go into a corporation and then grow that way? Or are you of the mind, hey, start at the corporation right away because that's where you're going to anyway if you can do it right away? What do you yeah. typically do? I think if your budget allows you to do it right away and you are really committed to your business, it makes sense to incorporate from the beginning because you are going to benefit from that limited liability protection from the very beginning. Um, I understand why people tend to start as a sole proprietorship and kind of see how things are going to go. The issue is you can have liability as a very small business. 
Um, and so really you have to assess your risk. You have to see whether there's insurance that can perhaps cover you. But if you're in a high risk business or if you own a business with someone else um, and if insurance is prohibitive or it's difficult to obtain for the thing that you're doing, then incorporating from the very beginning makes sense. It all is also necessary if you're looking for investors, right? Because otherwise all you will get is debt. So if you are looking to grow your business through investing, it makes sense to start off um, as a corporation. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, Tanya, you should be able to share your screen, right? Okay, yes. And then... I just, oh, are you able? No, I don't think you can see from the beginning. Oh, I can see it. Can you see the notes or can you see the slide? I can see the notes too. Okay. Okay, so let me just swap. Same. And now there's a slide. There's a slide? Yeah. Okay, yeah, because my notes are for me. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, we are in your hands. I will mute myself and you can do your thing. Okay, so thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. I hope that you're staying safe and healthy during this uncertain time. Um, I would like to also thank Ryan for having me and thank you, Andrew, for that presentation. I'm the founder and, and owner of Walker Law, commercial litigation firm, and I'm a trial lawyer, but I really try to help people uh, resolve their disputes. And I also appear periodically on uh, a few television stations such as CTV, CBC, and CP24. Um, I, we're going to send a, an email to you after this presentation. And um, I just want you to keep in mind that we are, have partnered up with a charity called Renewed Computer Technology. And what that charity does is collect used um, items such as computers, laptops, and phones, and donates them to children who are in need. Uh, many uh, children need this technology now because they're learning from home and who knows when they'll be back in school. And um, in the black community, the need is quite high. So if there's anything that you have that's kind of just laying around your home that you're not using, please contact me afterwards and we can arrange to get that from you and donate that to Renewed Computer Technology. Also, if we're going to ask you to fill out just a brief survey, it's about three, takes three minutes of your time. It's just for us to be able to improve. Um, we're doing webinars quite often now in comparison to a few months ago. And so if there's anything that you like to see or not see, if you decide to join us for any other webinars in the future, um, I greatly would appreciate that. And to thank you for your time, we'll send you a gift card. It's a Starbucks gift card. It looks like this. It says Walker Law on it. It's not a business card. It's a gift card. So do not throw it away. You could actually buy a coffee with it. Okay. And... Uh, Thank you, Anne. I'm glad that you love it. <laughs> and then um, we- are... I know, I want some of those. How do you- Yeah, so fill out the survey after. afterwards and I'll-, I'll No, I'll but to give away, right away. Like, Yeah, like we're, gonna give, we're giving away, away, away just for filling out the survey, but just don't fill yeah. out your address. Actually fill out some of the comments <laughs> yes. so we can improve. And so just to awesome. let you know, because we're doing webinars quite often. Next week, mm. I'm doing a webinar for the Black Business Professional Association on negotiating contracts. We spoke a little bit about that earlier. Now I'll be speaking about that next week for about an hour because it's a really hot topic. People really want to understand how to negotiate a contract, especially one they've already signed. Um, we'll be speaking about property law on June 24th and then um, employment law on Ju July the 9th. The law is changing like, every day and we actually circulate an internal spreadsheet. So it's a good way to, for you to keep on top of the law without actually having to uh, watch the three speeches by the provincial, municipal, and federal government every day. So just my roadmap for today is I'm just going to explain briefly what litigation law is, and then I'll pause and answer any questions you may have. And then after that, I'll answer, I'll speak about what may happen to you if you fail to structure yourself properly. So Andrea told you um, what you need to do to structure yourself. And, and so I will uh, talk a little bit about what happens if you don't. So first of all, what is litigation law? That, those are my robes. I miss wearing them so much because I haven't been in court since February, um, but I have argued on the phone or by video conference. And so litigation is, when you hear the word litigation, here are a few de things that come to mind. It's you, someone saying, you owe me money, or you're saying that person owes money to you. Um, it's also preventing, Andrea mentioned your intellectual property. 
preventing the copying of your designs. Uh, if you have um, a classic example is an Apple Macintosh computer, you manufacture your own that has a pair that looks similar to that Apple. Uh, by all means, Apple will be bringing you to court to get an order to, from a judge to, for you to stop producing something that looks like theirs. Um, third, it's resolving partnership or shareholder disputes. Shareholders sometimes believe companies are not being run properly or want to exit the company and want to be paid a certain amount. And so if, the, if they can't be resolved between the shareholders or the company, then a judge will have to make a decision. Um, same thing with a partnership. And also land, people don't realize um, land disputes are dealt with quite a lot bit in court. I specialize in property, employment and contract disputes. And so we deal with people who both of you may have title in land and you want to get out of it. You don't want your name in that title anymore and the other person won't sign the paperwork. So a judge will make that order for it to be sold. So that's what a litigation law is. And before I go on to uh, B, uh, what happens when you fail to structure your business properly? Um, are there any questions? Or else I'll just continue. Okay, I'll continue. So one thing is that uh, these are the mistakes I see when it comes to me and people are arguing or fighting over this. These are the top three things I wonder why didn't they do this properly or why wasn't this documented? Number one, what happens when you fail to structure your business properly? Um, you, you, they, people don't understand the differences between incorporation and sole proprietorship, right? So somebody comes to me and they say, Tanya, some, I, I was told that I might be sued, but I have a business. And I, the first question I ask is, is it incorporated? No, it's not. That means you can be sued personally. So what does that mean? Anything that's in your name um, can, is subject to be taken away from you. So if you sign a contract, and I just signed a contract, Tanya Walker, uh, in my personal capacity, someone sues me, they win, they get to start, they get to do quite a bit to try and collect their money. They can sell uh, your home, they can cash out your RSPs, they can garnish funds in your bank account. One day you just go to withdraw money and the money's frozen because that, those have been garnished. So people don't necessarily understand that. They don't understand the business relationship. And sometimes, so when they come to me, I wonder to myself, why didn't you just incorporate? And so that's, that's a problem. Another problem that I see is oral contracts. People sign um, by shaking hands and they don't have anything to prove what they've agreed to. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm stuck with many sheets of paper trying to carve out or explain to a judge what your contract was. And it costs more money. It costs more time. And it's a, it's a huge mistake that people make. And um, it really makes more sense to me to hire someone like Andrea to help you get your ducks in a row before you start the business. A third problem that I see that's huge is that people do not read contracts before they sign them. And so what happens is you want to rent a commercial space. The landlord gives you a contract. You just sign it. You don't even know what you're signing. And so what happens, I've seen uh, quite a bit in the last year, people, the tenants don't even get the keys. They say to the landlord, you know what? I decided not to go ahead with this. I don't want this property anymore. The landlord then sues that person for the remainder of the time left on the contract, sometimes five years, five years of rent for you to pay where you didn't even have the keys. And then I realized that person has also signed an extra line. So they signed on behalf of a corporation, but they also signed a personal guarantee. So they personally, they can be sued personally and their company can be sued for something that they didn't even enjoy the benefits of. And so next thing you know, someone's losing their home, monies are garnished, uh, your wages are kind of frozen um, because a person did not read the contract before signing them. And if you read it and you appreciate it, you probably will negotiate and say, listen, I don't want a personal guarantee or if I'm going to give a personal guarantee, maybe it's 10% of whatever is due, not 100%. So those are three huge problems that I see um, when people do not, um, when people end up hiring me in, as a litigator. So what happens if you fail to structure yourself, your lawsuit options? Um, I mentioned earlier, request a settlement meeting. Always, always try to settle 
Um, the court system is based on settling. So even when you sue somebody and they respond, you are required to attend a settlement meeting, whether it's small claims court or superior court. Um, small claims is less than $35,000 involved in the lawsuit. Um, there's always a settlement meeting. Um, there's even sometimes settlement meetings right before your trial. Sometimes my trial starts on Monday, I get a call from the court on Friday, I'm going to attend another settlement meeting with a judge. Consider using a mediator. Sometimes you may need one if your lawsuit is filed in Toronto, its mediation is mandatory. A mediator is a third party that you select to try and help you settle. Be prepared for the settlement or mediation. Think about what you want, what you're willing to give, what you're willing to bend on, so then you're not, you're not making a decision based only on stress that you will regret later. And what should businesses do when they anticipate a lawsuit? Keep in mind that you cannot go back on a promise that you've made in the settlement agreement. That is also a contract. So if you do have a settlement meeting, you do sign a, an agreement, you can't go back on it without there being consequences. Think about legal costs if you decide to settle. And if you also settle, um, you should sign this document called the release. That means you're not going to sue me and I'm not going to sue you for these issues that we've already dealt with. Because what's the point of settling if someone goes and sues you for what you just settled on? So that's a bit of a summary of litigation um, and the mistakes that I see when people don't uh, have their documentation prepared and why they end up in court and why they end up spending so much money and the risks are huge. You can lose your house. You can lose investments, things you've saved your entire life for. So it's really should be taken seriously. And um, that's my summary of litigation for today. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much to both Andrea and Tanya. We do have a couple minutes if there are questions. I'll check the chat real quick. I don't think there's any questions in there. But if you did have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask. And I'll see if there's anyone that comes in. So I have a question, Ryan. I heard two people, Marcel and, and Marcel, Anne. I believe. All right, and one sec. Uh, Marcel, you can go ahead. Uh, my question has to do with um, partnerships. I have a corporation myself, and I have found some some difficulties. Uh, we work with a lot of MOUs um, when when dealing with our partnerships, and we've had some some interesting things happen. Um, what's your recommendations when it comes to MOUs, and how legally binding are they really? Like if if somebody did not come through with a deliverable, um, how, how do I go about facing that? I'm muted. Tanya, Tanya? do you want to take that one? Or Andrea? Tanya? Andrew, Andrew, do you want to take that one? I don't deal. Yeah, so <laughs> is there a reason why you're using memorandums of understanding as opposed to to actual contracts. Yes, um, most of the groups that we partner with, uh, this is this is specific to nonprofits. Right. Uh, seem to want to take the MOU route, mm -hmm. and th that's always like the the ones I've dealt with have been very aggressive in in, in wanting the MOU. Um, explaining to me that that you know it, it's good for both sides we can easily back out and, and it sounded appealing in the beginning but once you know you're in bed with the said corporation or, or sorry nonprofit, mm -hmm. and maybe some of the del deliverables as i said were not met uh, on their end um it was advantageous advantageous for them but not yes. for us and then we find ourselves in a kind of a legal limbo as to okay. how we can pursue. But really it was, it's based on them being very, very aggressive on the MOU rather than taking legal contracts. Right. So there is a gray area because most MOUs will say, this is not legally binding. This is not enforceable. In which case my question is, you know, kind of what is the point, right? The idea of having a written agreement is so that it's really clear what you can expect of someone else and what they can expect of you. 
And my concern with you being involved with um, other parties whose reason for not wanting a contract is that we can back out, that is a huge red flag. Because if what you want is for them not to back out, right? You want them to provide what it is they said they were going to provide. So beyond law, <laughs> just as a matter of general, um, you know, doing business, it's important that you're able to enforce the deliverables that are that are necessary for your business because it's usually a two-way street, right? Either you've paid them or you've done something for them and now you're expecting them to do something back for you. Um, you need to be able to enforce that. And so the next time that you're dealing with a not-for-profit, and I understand that, you know, people can push back, um, but you can push back as well and say, and you can say, look, I've had this experience. It's really important for me for us to be clear about what we can expect from each other. And if it is that you don't think that you're in a position to commit to this, then this is probably not something that we should pursue right now. You know, maybe they need to figure out how they can commit to it, but there really is no point in having an understanding if either person can just decide, well, it no longer works for me. I'm done with this. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Ryan, we couldn't hear you. I was saying, and if you wanted to go ahead. <laughs> Oh, yes, Ryan. Okay, I'm sitting here and my brain is screaming, Ryan. So, number one, um, two questions. When that gentleman that just came on, in regards to the people that are using, even if you're dealing with um, non-for-profit, for-profit, any organization, the first red flag to any business is when someone is using a memorandum. That's not binding, period. So, I mean, it's just like a little note they're passing off in regards to conversations and deals and what I'm going to do and what you're going to do. But, I mean, he should never, ever do that. And even when he sees it, he should be like, oh, no, if you don't want a contract, forget it. I'm not doing business with you. I'm just keep it going because you're not serious, right? Mm -hmm. Because any organization, um, by the way, I'm all about legal information, people, because legal information is so powerful. And... That's, and I'm all about processes and procedures, and that's what my legal information business is about, right? So I love what both of you, um, my co-colleagues, said. I have some things that I want to address, though, with the first presentation, so something that she said. Um, but, but the first thing that he should do, Ryan, is never, ever do business with them. Because, I mean, I volunteer for maybe 10 years with, with an organization, and they always do contracts, Right? No matter what it is, right? Never a memo. I'm, I was just sitting in my seat laughing like, a memo? What? That's where he should run and say, absolutely not. And that's, that's, that's the red flags that go bing, 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 bing. Oh, you guys are not serious. And that's how the black community, no matter what business you're in, you lose money. Because you want to do good. You want to give back. You want to help. You want to support. But yet, you have these individual persons, it don't matter about color, but you have these individual persons who come to the table who want to do business, yet they're not doing it correctly. And then you, you have a lot of loss, 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 loss when it comes to your business, right? Right, right. And the other thing that I want to address with, with um, the last um, lawyer that spoke about what you didn't talk about is verbal agreements, because I love verbal agreements, because sometimes, right, when you, you can't have a written contract, Right? Mm -hmm. um, you have to go because late people are always in court because my market is stuff represented people, right? I love talking to those people because they're, most of them don't have money. They can't afford a lawyer. And that's why I changed my business to help those people understand the power of processes and procedures. So if you're going to court, you can understand how to do um, motions. You can understand open arguments, closing arguments. You can understand all these little things as a laid person going to self-represent if you understand the justice system, processes, and procedures, right? Once they understand that, then they'll be good in, in, in a structural format when they're going into to any courthouse or any courtroom, right? And verbal agreements for late people, mm. because sometimes you don't have the time to write things down, get them all down in legal ease and in documents, right? So if, if these late people can understand what a verbal contract is and the meeting of the minds, what the test is and so forth, then that could help them in regards to some of their agreements. And my litigator, because I love litigators, right? Because um, you got to go in there and argue and fight and, you know, 
get all the juices out. I love that. Someone told me I should be a litigator, but I said no. My love, <laughs> my love, you have the gift of the gap. Everybody keeps telling me, Anne, you have the gift of the gap, girl. But I always say to them, no, my energy is processes and procedure. That's what our people do not understand, right? Awesome. And when I, even when I talk to young people about what their rights are, they have lawyers leading them instead of them leading lawyers, right? And they're scared to use their voices. So I'm, I'm always in, 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 in the conversational piece in regards to you have to own your own power. And the only way to do that is to understand processes and procedures. So my sister, awesome. if you would just tell us what is, what is the, the um, verbal agreements, because I love verbal contracts because they're so easy and simple when people get the basics of those understood, when they can't get it written down. As a litigator, my sister, you can maybe go into those pieces. Because I feel that verbal contracts are so important to people who um, don't want to get into contracts or don't understand contracts. Or So if they understand those little pieces, maybe that could help them a little bit too, sis. Okay. All right. No, and I think you were a litigator in another life, though. You're, you're... Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was graduating, I graduated. I have my BA in law, right? Because I graduated from Humber Bachelor's Program, right? But what I find, um, my sister, the, the way I find that I can give back to my community is for them to understand the power of legal information. And if they can understand the power of what is the process, what is the procedure, once they understand that, because you can have a great case, but you can mess it up because you don't understand processes and procedure. That's what I'm trying to teach the people because it's so key, my sister, and for them to understanding the legal road that is so twined up if you go left uh oh you're going in the ditch uh oh if you go right uh you're going right if the processes and procedures are all right. understood and one sec. all right let's hear the answer okay yeah <laughs> thank you for your question Anne. so i mentioned it before handshakes and why yeah. i understand handshakes because you may be in a rush or you just may have that really relaxed relationship yeah but it is important for someone like me that needs to prove that your handshake was a contract to follow it up in writing. So that could even be an email, that could be a text message. So you need yes. a contract to really be a contract. You need an offer, you need an acceptance, and exactly. you need to exchange money. So all you can say in an email or a text message, I've used, I use text messages in court quite a bit, is, you know, I confirm that you will do this for yes. $50 and it will be complete. Could you just please text back, confirm if you agree, and the person writes back, confirm, boom, contract, right? There you go. So I get to yep. show, like, that's what I that's what I get to show to a judge instead of like fifty pieces of paper and say, okay, exactly. well, exactly this and this and this. It's just in one nice little email or text message. So that's important. And second, yep. the second point you made about leading your lawyer, I agree with that. We sometimes act like you work for us, but we work for you, and so with litigation, I always say to my client, because everybody has a different, like th they want something different, right? So we represent small, medium businesses in Fortune 500s. We represent PayPal across Canada. And so some, cl some clients, they just want to settle it. They just want it to go away. There's some clients that just want to fight it. There's some clients, they want to maintain the relationship. They're in a fight with a business partner, but they want to continue to work in a business with them. And so my, one of my first questions to you is, what do you want? And there's so many people who don't even know what they want. And once I find out what you want, then I can recommend a strategy for litigation that helps you get what you want. Because if you just want to kind of beat someone down, the strategy is different than if you want to continue to work with them. So it's, yeah. it's very important to, to keep that in mind when you deal with Andrea or when you deal with me, what do you want? Yeah. Excellent. No, thank you so much. Um, just a quick final check if there are any other questions. Uh, I have a follow-up. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm a bit confused. I'm here to learn, by the way. Uh, so my question about the MOU is because I have a lack of knowledge. So thank you guys for, for um, expanding my wisdom in this area. But I'm a bit confused as to the difference between a verbal contract and an MOU, which I got laughed out of the room for mentioning. 
for me, I, I guess for me, like when you come to me, um, a memor memorandum of understanding isn't really a contract contract. It's kind of saying, like when I see them, um, there's usually a contract that follows. So it says, mm -hmm. here's our memo of understanding. So it's like, if, if Ryan were to enter into a business relationship with me, and we're about to, we're thinking about hiring Andrea, we might just create our own memo of an understanding to say, these are the terms, like this is how much he's going to contribute, how much I'm going to contribute, what our business is going to be about, you know, it's like a summary. And then it would go to Andrea and then Andrea could put that into a contract into the legal ease. So to me, it's not really a contract contract. And so a verbal contract is actually a contract contract, right? It's, it's, I shook your hand and I said, you're, I'm going to pay you to do this for me and I'll pay you by next week and you'll complete the work by tomorrow. And then I will follow up in an email or a text message to confirm that just in case things don't work out. We have some evidence because when you deal with judges, they want evidence, right? You know, you testify and you go on the stand and all that, but really what makes a big difference is evidence because people honestly right. change their stories completely right. when they're on the stand. Yep. I've been through a lot of trials. So that, that's my understanding of the difference between a verbal contract and a MOU. Um, I, I, I can't really speak about MOUs because I don't litigate them because the only time I actually see them is when a contract comes afterwards. Okay. It's, it's, it's an enforceability. So verbal contracts can be enforced if you can prove the substance of the contract. Whereas MOUs usually have a clause specifically saying, this does not create any legal rights. But but verbal so contract it's that line that really messes up. The <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's that's what it's intended yeah. for. It's not but intended to bind you. I don't find yeah. it. Right. Um, and so so verbal contracts can be enforced, but verbal contracts are going to always be by by their very nature basic, right? When you have a verbal contract, even if you follow up with an email, most of it's going to be what do I have to pay or what are you going to pay me and what is it that I have to deliver? And the issue is you can have disputes that come that are not related to those issues, right? You can have disputes that we talked about force majeure. Force majeure is not something that you would ever have in a verbal contract because no. no one is saying in the event of war, strikes, epidemics, pandemics, no one is saying that and no one is writing that in an email. And so right. the issue with verbal contracts if it is, you know, if you have a dispute about something that's in, that's, that you can prove in the verbal contract, fine. If, the, if it's a simple thing like he told me he was going to charge $100 and he charged me $500 instead and you have, you know, email confirmation, fine. But if it's anything that's not contained in the very, in the very basic parts of the contract, you're going to be out of luck because you're not going to be able to prove to the court what it was that you agreed on. Right. So there's no way to, to legally enforce an MOU if somebody did not deliver. A yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I guess there's a, the only way, I mean, there's ways, there, there's always loopholes. And I guess if a MO, like a memorandum of an understanding said that, you know, a contract's supposed to follow in two weeks and failing which this is going to be the contract or something along those lines, then it could be a contract. Could it have to have very specific language? Like when I'm dealing with a judge, I have to, you know, be on point and I have to, you know, you need very, very specific language or specific evidence um, or else it's going to be difficult to convince somebody who's your decision maker of what actually happened. Right. And this is a very interesting conversation because now that I work a lot more in the nonprofit world, I do get approached with memorandums of understanding a lot. And I always feel like, oh, great. This is what is going to allow us to work together. And, you know, at the time, you're not thinking about uh, chasing after them for stuff not done. But you would believe that if something that is verbal is enforceable, then you do have something on paper that should also be enforceable. And hearing now that you have to really check those lines that give them an out where it's like, hey, Andrew is saying that line that says, hey, this is not legally binding, completely takes away all your leverage. Yeah. But, also, so, but you also have to, sorry, you also have to look at the behavior, right? So regardless of sometimes what the contract says, if you behave differently, so you behave in accordance as if that, con everybody behaves as if that contract actually exists, then a judge, like if it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it's a duck. 
So if you, if you, if you, like someone says later on, well, it was just a memorandum of understanding and it's not enforceable, but we've been acting like it for the last five years. Guess what? A judge is going to say, well, obviously you thought it was a contract, so I'm going to treat it like one. So that, that, those, what, those things that get you out of it don't work if you don't behave in accordance with them. That's called yeah. waiver. You're waiving the right. So you also have to be very aware of that, um, waiving your rights and then someone saying this wasn't really it and then, but you've been acting like it yeah. for quite some time. But then the behavior is what forms the contract more so yes. than you're, so you're enforcing the contract that's being created by the behavior rather than enforcing the MOU itself. Yes. Right. Yes. And I'm glad, and I'm glad Ryan brought up, um, specific, that's why I was specific to nonprofits because mm -hmm. in my sector, the services we offer are really centered around the nonprofit field. Yeah. I am a corporation. We did start off as a nonprofit and stepped away from that for a plethora of reasons. Um, but we find that when dealing with nonprofits in particular, they seem to drive the MOU and really push that. And they base it on, you know, we're a nonprofit. We, we may have the funds sometimes, we may not. We may be able to deliver on this and then we may not. And it, it's, it's a really difficult, uh, you know, demographic for me to navigate. And I feel like, hey, maybe I'll lose the potential future contract if I don't lock in with this MOU. Yeah, so we don't play their game. <laughs> right. So thank you guys. Yeah, don't play that game. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and I saw you had unmuted before. Did you have a follow-up question? Or? Well, I, I did. In terms of when it came to the other sister saying that a verbal contract, because a verbal contract, there's, there's tests. And you, as she's saying, if there's a pandemic, or anything because when I'm having conversations with people, that's why I'm saying legal information is powerful because when you're having conversations with people and they want to do verbal contract, you let them know it's like a written contract. You can put anything into a verbal meeting of the minds. There's a, there's offer acceptance. There's, there's a test, right? So anything you can incorporate in, in, in a verbal contract as a written contract, the two persons that are actually doing the contract just need to understand these are all the things I want to put in my verbal. And if they accept all those things, we're good. So it's just about the information that the two individuals need to be doing and letting them know that when you're doing a verbal, every single thing you want in a verbal can be incorporated just like a contract. Just to be clear about verbals, because verbals are very powerful if they're done correctly. And the way that they can be done correctly is if the individuals have the correct information and how to do them. And then they'll be good. Yeah, that's great to know. And just as we wrap up, I don't know if Andrea, you have any final words? And then Tanya, if you had final words after? Um, I have a final word. So Tanya, I just wanted to say how much of a pleasure it's been um, being on this with you. You were someone that I, you know, looked up to and continue to look up. When I was starting my firm, you were the example of um, this strong Black woman who had started her own practice and had a successful practice. So it's, it's been an honor to be on this with you. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. I've, I've enjoyed and I've been honored to present. I love presenting to my community. Um, knowledge, I do agree with Anne, knowledge is power. And once power. you have that power, no, you know, we're unstoppable people. Absolutely. And, you know, despite what has happened, we have come a long way. We still have a long yes. way to go. But Absolutely. Um, we'll keep on growing and becoming more powerful um, as we gain more knowledge and share it with each other. Absolutely. Sis, I also have a last question in regards to your donations. If I have anything like cell phones, because I know I have a few of them lying around, I just have to dig it up. I'd um, love to donate it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm dig it up, contact yeah, me, will. and I'll put you in touch I with will. my assistant, Mandy. And okay. um, depending, if you're, if you're far away from our, where we are, because we're downtown, I'm but the charity, the charity, okay, because if you're far, because there's someone who was in Brampton, and the charity, which is funded by, by the federal government, went and picked it up from his home on his okay. porch. So, oh, okay. but if you're in the, if you're downtown, we will we'll arrange to get it from you because it's very important for yeah. children, especially young black children, to continue yep. to be educated. It's you know, hard enough with the Wi-Fi, but if you don't even have the devices, how are exactly. you exactly? And again, knowledge is power. So you got to get absolutely. Them power. 
Yeah, so I'll dig them up, and if I can have a number, I'd love to have a conversation with you. That would be great. Okay, um, we'll send you guys a Yeah, so we'll send, uh, I, I think Ryan has the registration information, and we'll get that yes. from Ryan, and we'll send that newsletter so you can sign up for future webinars, and you get Absolutely. Act, and, and then we can go from there. Absolutely, love and that. Your, Thank and get you. your coffee. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Again, this was a uh, plethora of info, great info. And I'm so yeah. glad we were able to get this so it can live on and people can access it when they have these questions around how to structure and protect our businesses. Coming out of COVID is going to be something different, but let's yep. come out of it structured powerful. and yes, more powerful than we came into it. <laughs> All right. So have a great rest of the day. I'll thank talk you. to you soon. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, everyone. Thank you.